Here we are. This, uh, we're going to look uh, at the Bible together. We are, I'm going to read in just a few moments from the book of Philippians. We are um, in a series we've called A Life Worth Living. Now, previously uh, in A Life Worth Living, uh, Paul has already reminded his hearers that he considers life is only worth living when it is all about Jesus, announcing him, declaring him, advancing him, defending him, honoring him, relishing him. It's all about savoring Jesus. Today we're going to get to the bit where Paul is suggesting that, well, sooner or later, and Paul would like it to be sooner, please, if we know anything about this all for Jesus life, anything about this life worth living, well, do you know what? We should live like it's worth living. Of course we should. And so he writes, let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. I'm going to read the whole passage in a moment. But you see, how you lived, your, your manner of life, was kind of a big deal in Philippi. Although it was actually on mainland Greece, it had special status in the Roman Empire. Effectively, it had become Italian soil, where all the laws and the language, uh, all the architecture, the currency, and the fashion were thoroughly Roman. They knew how to live in every aspect of their life like it was worth following the ways of Rome, uh, the great empire. And so the term manner of life would have really resonated with them. Paul only hoped they put the same kind of effort into living, behaving, like Jesus' ways were worth following. What about us? We're going to listen to Paul in a moment and see what resonates with us right here and right now. What might each aspect of our lives say about a life worth living? For us as well, it's not just a, a matter of what it might say in theory, it's deciding what an all-for-Jesus life worth living actually looks like today, tomorrow, the next week, and so on, in all of our behavior. It's more than just knowing something's worth doing, you know. There's plenty of things in life that we know are worth doing, and we may or may not get round to doing them. I was thinking, um, flossing, <laughs> eating less, exercising more, going to bed early, uh, driving within the speed limit, saving before spending, choosing friends wisely, decluttering, living sustainably, avoiding impulse purchases, doing now what could, you know, we might otherwise put off for another day. Oh, the list goes on and on, doesn't it? Paul's asking if we actually live like Jesus is worth it. So let's hear how we might begin that life worth living, as I read now from Philippians chapter 1. I'm going to start at verse 27. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now here that I still have. Okay. The first thing I want to draw our attention to, <laughs> the things that Paul says a life worth living might include, is this. Stand firm in one spirit and with one, uh, one mind. Hmm. 
what is standing firm? And, and why is it the first way to live a gospel-worthy life? What would it have meant to them? You see, standing firm was a bit of a military term. It's something they would have uh, known Roman soldiers did. Those who lived for and defended Rome and all it stood for stood firm in the confidence of Rome and its might and authority. Later in Philippians, uh, in this same letter to them, in chapter 4 and verse 1, Paul tells them a second time to stand firm because they're citizens of heaven more than citizens of Rome. People who know where they are, where they belonged, where their authority was from, stood firm just in that place. They don't get caught off guard or off balance. They stand fast. They persevere. They endure. They're not budging an inch. They're holding their ground. They're utterly unyielding. You're standing firm. It's not just some sort of stubborn intransigence. Bolshy because I want to be. It's standing firm somewhere quite specific. Standing firm, you see, is where any of us and all of us will need to begin this life worth living. We stand at the place God saved and redeemed us. Not somewhere we've manoeuvred ourselves to. Not in a kind of life that we've improved enough to think, yeah, I think this is good enough. I'm going to park up here. This is how I want to live my life. No, we're living as those rescued by Jesus and standing in that place that he's rescued us to. That's great news because we don't have to bolster up our own lives in any kind of way. I don't think we could. It's not down to us to shore up some kind of place that'll hopefully be safe enough but will it really as if we could ever make our lives firm firm or firmer than Jesus has done in dying for us and rising to life again we're here through the love of the father through the work of the son through the whisper of the spirit and so Paul wrote stand firm in one spirit. We began in the spirit and we remain in the spirit. It's in the spirit that we stand firm together. The Holy Spirit comes and convicts me of my need. The spirit reveals the truth to me. The spirit affirms me and assures me of my place to stand in him. I'm not budging from there. Why would we? I wonder how you expect to live a life worth living. Rushing around, squeezing it all in, or standing firm. Collecting as much as you can, uh, or getting hold of the truth that you have in Jesus. Achieving great results or persevering with or without apparent results. Standing firm. Experiencing it all or enduring through it all. We are called to stand firm. There's seemingly no end of options in life uh, for things that people feel make a life worth doing or worth living. But one in spirit says God's life is our life worth living. That place of rescue, that place of salvation that he's brought us to. One in spirit and with one mind we stand firm. This is not about appearances. It's much more than appearing together. Dancers, synchronized swimmers, they can appear completely in step. I can't dance, so that was never going to work. Okay. But one in mind means something on the inside, not just something on the outside. Unanimous feelings, reactions, emotions, and ambitions. One in mind. Not my idea of unity. 
Not yours either. Not unity by some sort of pragmatic consensus or mutual agreement. Not by negotiation or hustle, ducking and diving, wheeling and dealing. One mind is about wanting to know God's mind throughout our lives. One in mind. One in what does God have in mind for us? How are we one in that? This has always been the calling for Jesus' followers. Yet in these angry and divided days, it seems all the more important that the church stands firm in this radical and distinctive unity. We're not just trying to appear together. God has called us together in Jesus. Stand firm in his spirit, in one mind. Let us stand firm, one in spirit, one in mind. Clear where we stand. Confident of the spirit's calling to stand there. Committed in heart and mind. Because it's at that place that Paul goes on to say the next thing about this life worth living, that we are striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Once we're clear where we stand and how we got there, we are in the best place to know how we put our own effort into this life worth living. We get it in a muddle, we think we've got to make the effort to get to a firm place, and then God has to do everything else to make it work. (laughs) Actually, God got us to that firm place, and then there's a place for us and our responsibility in how we do that. And Paul calls it striving side by side. We strive side by side for the faith of the gospel. Now, striving, like standing firm as it happens, uh, was a familiar term to the Philippians reading Paul's letter. Striving is what gladiators did. I just imagine I'm holding gladiators' weapons there. It's easy, isn't it? You know, tridenty thing, the netty blanket stuff. Uh, It's what they did uh, as they fought in the arena. Okay. But they did it for their own survival, their own glory, their victory, their reputation. Gladiators were highly trained. They were dedicated to their manner of life. Paul knew that. That's why he wrote about it in those terms. It was essential they learnt how to strive in every possible situation that they might face. Because they knew they were going to go out there and get into a whole bunch of situations in their life. and They were going to be ready to strive. Always, which way? What am I going to face? What weapons? What attack? How do I train for that? How do, I, well, how do I put myself through the paces so that I can do that when I'm there? I want to think about that now. I'm going to strive for that. And yet this is striving uh, side by side. It's going to take effort to achieve and maintain. It'll take focus and attention. Everybody who knew the gladiator's life knew that. If you didn't concentrate, <laughs> You see, community is surprisingly hard to create among people with, dare I say, only the gospel in common. It's relatively easy for me to connect with people who like me, who like the same cheese as me. I mean, that, that's still, but we, we've got such common grounds, okay? The same ideas, expectations, attitudes and tastes or expressions. But that's not a community, that's a tribe. I define my tribe by my cheese preferences. You define your tribe by whatever your preferences in life are. Church is not a tribe. Church is a Jesus community. It's defined by him, by his heart and his mind. That's the place where we are at one. It's defined by his love. I want to make two quick points about that. This striving was Beside them and not with them. You get that. Paul, ever the wordsmith, picks his words and then picks how he's going to use them too. So he's using this familiar term of gladiators striving in an unfamiliar way for maximum impact. Instead of striving against each other, 
Uh, they're striving with each other for unity, alongside them. He needs to say that to the Philippians because it turns out in chapter 4, two people get a shout out for the wrong reasons. They're definitely striving against each other. And he needs to name them and say, guys, do something. Get along. <laughs> sort it out. Do you see church as a place to strive with others or beside them, I wonder? Striving for their approval, for their recognition, for their support, for your agenda. Maybe this is a moment to settle who you're called to strive beside and stop striving with them. So that it was striving beside, but secondly, it was all striving. Firstly, we, we all need to do our bit. That's what all striving means. We're all striving, okay? There are no spectators, no passengers in this. Paul was writing to a whole church about an issue between two people. And it wasn't a case of, well, I wasn't there. Or, well, I was there, but I didn't say it. Or I didn't agree with it. You know, and it wasn't me. It's not my quarrel. I don't know why they said it. He's writing to the whole church because they all need to strive for this. If they said it, it's our problem. And he, he wants them all to strive for that unity. And secondly, since we're all doing this, we get to do this together. It's okay. The gospel, who just relax, is not all down to your effort or to mine. It's something we strive for together. So because we're all striving, we don't leave the striving to somebody else. Neither do we try and do all the striving for everybody else. Let's strive together, side by side, for the gospel. Maybe this is a day for renewed resolve to keep striving for the gospel. Maybe it's time to stop acting like this is all down to you. Maybe it's time to start acting like some of it is actually down to you. Maybe this is a time to recognize how I could stand beside someone else for the gospel. As things ease and it's possible to do more things, more things happening in person, there'll be great opportunities to very practically and very presently do that. It'll be great for us all to find a place to connect with that. But even before that, we, we strive together in prayer, whatever else we do. Let's make it our aim to strive together in prayer for the gospel in this church. So important. Thirdly, the third thing Paul said about this manner of life for a life worth living is about not being frightened. You see, finally, he's saying, if a life's worth living, it is one to be confident in. Unafraid, bold, courageous and intrepid. That's got to be good news to a world that seems to be living like life is just becoming a series of crises. We're not meant to live like life is a crisis. We're meant to live like life is worth living. After all, frightened is something most people are better at doing on their own, isolated and in the dark. I certainly am. When I'm standing with others, one in spirit, one in mind, striving together for all we believe is true and important, I'm more likely to be brave. <laughs> I wonder if you know that's true for you too. Just in case it was not obvious, Paul mentioned a couple of specifics not to be frightened of. I'm going to mention them quickly now. Firstly, in verse 28, he talks about opponents. Standing firm in unity, you see, makes important distinctions that we hope will be for everybody's good. Even though they need not to be exclusive distinctions, some people will oppose this. The Bible tells us, and you know what? It happens. So the Bible reminds us we're likely to have opponents, people who don't like us because of what we believe and what we're hoping to be together. Part of a life worth living 
will be loving them. The Bible speaks about us loving our enemies. And that would include those who would oppose us. They may still oppose us even after we've loved them. And we can still keep loving them. We don't need to be frightened of that. Secondly, suffering. In verse 29, Paul says that a life worth living will include hardship and suffering. You want an easy life? You might want to try something else. Christianity never promises to be an easy life. It promises to be a life worth living. Challenging people and challenging circumstances are inevitable, even in a life worth living. Because a life worth living chooses to suffer for God. He's worth suffering for. It turns out he thought you were worth suffering for. We see that in the Gospels, don't we? Challenge and opposition doesn't necessarily mean life's gone wrong or that it's no longer worth it. It certainly doesn't mean that we should give up and blame others and split up or whatever. Actually, it unites us with Paul and the Philippians in a life worth living. We are called to be more together. Let us know greater faith and greater courage together. Let me remind you, you have been called. You've been created and called to live a life worth living. All for Jesus' glory. Only the idea is that that changes your behavior. I wonder how bold, how courageous you will be about that. Will it be like it's really worth it? Because of Jesus... There's a firm place for your life. Ben, do you want to come up? That'd be great. Some may need to stop looking, uh, even for anywhere else firm to stand in their life. I don't know where you think your life is firm, how you think you're going to make it firm, but because of Jesus, there already is a firm place for your life. Let me remind you of that. I wonder what or who you would let drag you off of that place or put you off from that life. Paul is flagging up the possibility that he doesn't want that for any of us. Who are you going to stick by? How are you going to do that? I mean, really do that, not just appear to do that, perfectly synchronized on the outside, but really do that. Our response to Jesus, who is utterly amazing, is all wound up with our response to his church, which, frankly, is often not very amazing. One in spirit and mind. Let that be the manner of your life. Jesus thought his church was worth it, even though he knows it better than you and I do. We each live our lives in ways that say whether or not we agree with him about that. So what I want us to do now is to worship Jesus together, focusing on that place in him in which we stand so firm. Let's worship.